I, I want to give a nice, great introduction to Carlene. Carlene has been flying for 40 years. And what, 20 of that has been flight instruction? Is that right? Uh, yeah, for 21 years, but I've been uh, instructing at the airline level. So I've been flying and instructing, so. That's amazing. And so I'm curious to know, um, I know you, you're you type rated on the Airbus 350 and 330, mm -hmm. Boeing 777, 747, 200, 747, 400, 767, 757, 737, 727. Um, all of those that you have, you've been instruct, you've been an instructor on all of those planes? No, no, I've been- Type rated on some of them and instructing on some I, of them? I've been type rated on all of them. And then I've instructed on the 727, 37, 57, 747, 200, and then 400. So you fly for Delta and where are you based out of, Carly? I'm based in Los Angeles. You're based in Los Angeles. Yeah. Okay. Yay. Yay. So we thank you for, for being here for us this evening. You are so welcome. It's nice to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, you know, it's actually really nice because after your um, after a tough week in training and then knowing I got to get on an airplane and be awake all, you know, commute all night, then you kind of get tired and go, ah, what am I doing? And then really? it's, you remember because you see the fun of aviation again. <laughs> <laughs> you see the fun part with, with groups like this. So. Yeah, Gina's one of our founding members nice. for, for the Mile High chapter. So okay. Kelsey, Abby, I don't know if you knew that. Gina has Gina works for the FAA. Oh, very ah, nice. the big guns. <laughs> yes, nice. the big guns. Yeah, um, maintenance background, safety inspector for EON since 1991. So now I'm a safety manager and I've got all these volunteers that need something to do. So that's one reason I, I've been a woman in aviation for decades. Well, yeah, decades. And um, I joined the Mile High chapter, but what I can offer our chapter also are all these volunteers that need something to do in aviation. So when we have events, I like to tell Trimby and the rest of the board members that I've got people out there, most of them are pilots and they can probably help us if needed. Well, let's no, talk about I, let's let's talk about your books, Carlene. Okay, oh, yeah. where can we begin? <laughs> um, you know what? This is kind of there. Actually, is a theme through the whole thing, and it's really where we're aviation's going and where we're going to with it with this automation. And interestingly enough, I was talking to a Czech airman the other night, and I was um, telling him we we're discussing training, and I said, you know. ASAP reports are, are at an all-time high. Um, at our airline, I think they said there were 27,000 of them last year. And training's being cut back. And so actually, that's what my PhD was in, in aviation safety. I, I looked into manual flight and training and level of understanding and aviation passion. And, and so anyway, but my books, I've been kind of following this theme of history and now I've really projected the next one's really um you're going to see where it's going but we're going to pilotless aircraft this is what they're trying to do so interesting enough I'm talking this instruct Chuck Airman and I told him that um, my concern was that we really need need ALPA and the unions to really start enforcing more training because right now it's cutting back and we know the errors are out there so we know we have all these you know if you look up the statistics that millions of ASAPs between all the airlines. Okay, so the errors are there, the training's being cut back, the level of understanding's going down, and this is what I proved in my research, that the more pilots train at an airline level, the less they're apt to fly their airplane. And when they don't fly, their performance goes down. More in training, less apt to fly, which is a weird, weird thought, because you think more training would give you more confidence and more ability, it's just doing the opposite. And so I said to him, we're going to go to a pilotless aircraft, and when they get to that point, the industry is going to say, well, look, pilots just make errors. Look at all these ASAP reports, so we don't need them. We are going to use this automation. And he sat there, and he's a retired, he's, he was 40 years in the airline. He's retired now. He's done a lot of technology. He's a computer geek technology, did a lot of that online training, and he sat there, and he kind of smiled, and he said, well, I have to tell you, about five years ago, 
we had, um, I forget which company it was. So one of the, one of the big computer companies uh, called our company and rented the simulator. And they wanted to come in and, have, and they need an instructor to come in and work with them. And turns out that one of the individuals knew this guy. They had, you know, 30 years earlier sometime, they had been in the military together and they knew of each other. So they go in and he says, all we want to do is look at the rapid depressurization automated system. By the way, this is so cool. You could have a blowout in this A350 and not do anything. And the airplane watches its own pressurization and it starts to sit and knows how low to go and knows how to turn off. It, it's really a neat system, but this is what they wanted to watch. So, but they wouldn't tell them why. And so later after the session, they went out and had a beer together. And the reason they wanted to do this is because they were in there strictly because they're working on a pilotless aircraft. And this guy says, it will be here before you know it. Which sadly, what are we going to do with all the jobs? You know, the pilot jobs are going to be going away, which is unfortunate. Um, I told him, yeah, I don't think it's going to happen for completely for next 10 to 20 years. And he said, I wouldn't be so surprised. So they're working on it and they're trying to take, you know, make it happen. But anyway, so back to my books. This has kind of been my theme. It's kind of like the first novel was... Um, or Twimby fell in love with Darby, by the way. Um, the first novel was really, it was almost a, a more of a, I would say more of a woman's book, women's thriller. It was a three stories of three women friends who one was a flight attendant, one was a pilot, and one was a working woman and in the NTSB. And her husband wouldn't let her, didn't want her to work. So she stayed home and did the mother thing and wanted to go to work. The one who's single, Darby, who everyone thinks she has great life, uh, you know, she really wants something more, but she's the fun one and the flight attendant. So it's what these three women are going through um, the industry. So at first it was uh, the pilot shortage. Um, we had, we were dealing with industry issues because at the time, and this is probably when Abby was getting into this, they had just changed the flight hours. You needed to have 1500 flight hours to become a pilot before you needed 200. And so it was really shifting the industry. And I think what was going on in my mind, I'm thinking, ah, they're making a pilot shortage so they can support automated aircraft. Okay. And so then we have this whacked out pilot who really has, um, uh, really his heart is in, he wants to sustain the industry, but he's just doing it in a really bad manner. He's trying to prove that we need, he's going to crash airplanes to prove that, you know, that, that, Pilots are important. So, but anyway, so that's kind of, was kind of my thing, taking this all the way from the very beginning, what we're doing with industry changes into the next novel rolled into, um, that was flight for safety. And so that's when I got on the A330 and learned the different automation. And so now it's kind of like I started seeing training, substandard training and what's going on, how we're depending on these aircraft. And so went through the training thing and then uh, the next one, Flight for Survival. Now that was kind of the fun, really fun one for me. And it was more of a lighthearted read, but that's when I started my PhD in aviation safety. And I have to tell you, everything in my novels are real. Like uh, uh, Flight for Survival, the pilot who's bringing drugs in. Okay, I'm just gonna tell you this kind of stuff was going on, things that I've seen. So they're little bits in the books. And so then I did Flight for Survival and then Flight for Sanity was, was the Sanity was next one? Was that Trimby? <laughs> I don't know. I love my books out to my. Uh, to yeah, my I'm pilot. really certain that Flight for Sanity because my character is identifying training failures and problems in the industry and problems that's going on. And as she's identifying these, there's people who just don't want her to fix this. And she just wants to fix training and safety. And so then they pull her for mental health <laughs> and, and, and that whole book, you don't really see that she gets, um, gets back at that point. She's out, it ends being out, but all, all the while, while her theme is going on, we are dealing with the FAA, um, uh, automated flight training issues. Uh, here's a funny thing. My president, it was about, and not that we're going to get into any politics at all, but 
at the time President Trump was running. And I thought, wow, what an interesting thought to have a businessman for a president. And why would a businessman who's a billionaire want to be a president unless he had some ulterior motives? So in my novel, which um, I thought, okay, I'm going to have my businessman who owns the technology company, because if he becomes president, he can appoint the FA administrator and he can control the industry and automate it and sell his parts. Well, in my book, I came up with slogan, make aviation great again. Well, guess what happened? We got the businessman president who was going to make America great again, but he took my, <laughs> he took my slogan. Um, anyway, so uh, he's subsequently in jail, by the way. Um, and, and so this is how the stories are evolving. And then Flight for Truth was Darby's uh, fight for getting back. Her, her license back after her airline did this to her. And then Fly for Justice, the novel that I'm working on right now, is um, after all this happened, it's her, her fight in the, um, uh, just taking them to court and, this, and with the new law with this Air 21. And so there's a lot of things in the books. I do a lot of educational things like try and slip it in without really being as educational to, to let people know what uh, safety management systems are and safety culture and the importance of training. And the, uh, one of the interesting things in flight for safety, I have a, oh no, it wasn't, I think it was flight for, maybe it was flight for sanity, but there's a training chapter where they're messing with Darby in the simulator. They're gonna make her fail and they're really messing with her. And her first officer is, he's been warned, watch out, you know, they're going to get you if you support her, but he's not doing well. So I have a chapter where I have her teaching him how to do flows and how to, you know, how to learn, how to learn. And, and so, which is kind of fun. And now it's, it's interesting because people have used that chapter who are going to the airlines and going, it's kind of been rumored around, Hey, you got to get this book in this chapter. I've had people email me and ask me, can you just send me a copy of that chapter? <laughs> and so, so I go dig it out and send it to them. So, so there's good, some educational fun things in it. And then, uh, so we did Flight for uh, Flight for Truth, Darby got her job back and now Justice. So we're gonna do Flight for Justice. Um, the, and then there's gonna be two more. I was actually gonna do Flight for, um, I don't know, Flight, flight, for, auto, flight for Automation. But, and I'll give you guys a last novel because it's really kind of scary, but I keep getting more plot points. So I keep having to write another book. And the next one I'm going to write is Flight for Unity because after Darby has her, her issues and the fighting back with the company, she's realized that the union was also involved in this. And, and everything that's happened within the company has really taken all the way to the FAA, the highest level. And it has has all to do with, at the end of all these books, you're gonna find out that it has to do with this automation, that they were actually destroying the pilots. Um, my novel that I've been working on right now has, like I have the Max crash in there, and because it's it's similar, it's a, it's a safety management issue. Um, because of that, you know, there's, there's uh, Air 21 is the whistleblower law. I didn't realize this, but manufacturers didn't have any such law at the time. So the airline and are the manufacturer Boeing employees, Airbus employees were not protected to go in and, and report safety. Sadly, the FAA is the same way. They're not really protected. There's a group. Um, I forget what it's called, that there's a form that you can go through, but you're not protected under the United States under the government of the whistleblower sanction that you have to go on a, you kind of have to have the same people who might be retaliating judging you, which is kind of diff difficult. Um, so we get to learn about this and then I'll do Flight for Unity. And then the, the next novel, and I'll have to come up with a, a new one, is um, what happens when we get to automation, when we get to that point? And because the technology is there and right now, um, this was next gen, okay? But next gen is gonna be carried to way the later, you know, the, the next level. And security is an issue. How do we, is there, can you hack it? Or, you know, if they're automate flying aircraft from the ground, what are we gonna do to protect this? You know, and that's uh, the security, I think is the, the top thing going on right now. So last novel, end of the book, no, the beginning of the book, can you build a system 
that is absolutely secure? And the answer is, yes, I can, but don't do it. And at the end of the book, but there'll be a a lot more plot points going on and things happening in the middle, but at the end of the book, they did it. And then somebody's going to walk over and wire the, wire the money to their offshore bank account, and the person's going to hand the key over and let the bad guys into that facility. I mean, how scary is that? We'll have thousands of bombs in the sky because nobody's thinking about the ground-based facility It'll have to be tighter than the White House. Actually, now we, what we saw what happened to the White House is going to have to be really tight. Could you imagine if somebody broke into the ground-based facility that controlled every aircraft in the world? How scary is that? And it'd just be hundreds of thousands of bombs out there flying around. Um, so my retirement job is going to protect all your, everyone's job. Jabby, I'm going to protect your job. <laughs> <laughs> um, but really, that's I'm going to do everything I can to keep the automation at bay for as long as we can. Because could we do it? Could we fly airplanes without pilots? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, they have the technology. It's just, should we do it? And that's really the question. It'll be the, I, I really think it'll be the next level of terrorism. So this is kind of where my where my books are going and where the final book is. And then maybe it'll be so chilling that everybody will say, oh, we can't do that, you know? So we'll see. Anyway, that's the books. Oh, and then there's the motivation book, uh, uh, Fight to Success, and then the children's book. But I really want to write more children's books. Um, it's just, it's really hard to find time in the day to work and write. And, and I'm going to go to law school here soon. <laughs> It's my next adventure, yeah. So Anna's on now and Anna works for, well, she used to work for Jefferson Boeing and now she works at Lockheed Martin. And Anna has read your books. So Anna, you wanna unmute yourself? Do you have any questions? Oh, there you are. Hi Anna. Yeah, everyone's face didn't fit on. Maybe I wonder if I did that. You guys in the gallery. Oh, there you go. So I don't have any questions, but yes, I have read all your books and I thoroughly enjoyed them. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I'm that person that reads about four books a week, which is kind of insane, but. You sound like my husband, he'll get a book and then he just, he'll try and read a book a day if he can, you know. Yeah, so. it's a lot harder now with work, but it gets interesting. <laughs> I can imagine. So mm -hmm. what do you think about the way we're going with the automation and the aircraft? So, I mean, I'm a software engineer, so I know it can be done yeah. and I've done it personally, but I just don't see any manufacturer taking on that liability. I mean, you're talking about almost 200 people in an aircraft relying on a computer and I know computers are not perfect. <laughs> yeah. And see, and, and that's a question because the next gen the airplanes we can program them and they can take off ultimately we will take off fly to destination do an arrival and land and with next gen we're supposed to be um uh spacing ourselves from the other aircraft but i think what's going on is they're going to be more uh and more like a drone flying is where i think they're headed so it'll be a ground-based operator and and i i don't know i just i i guess i'm i'm I guess I'm disappointed in ethics and people, you know, nothing surprises me anymore that people will do stuff for money. And, and so that's the scary thing that I know now people will do anything for money. And could they, would they take over an airplane and, and probably so. Yeah. And it's a lot easier to do than people think. <laughs> right, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I can see it maybe in a private type aircraft, but not in a full on commercial aircraft. Yeah, so. they, the military has been doing the interesting thing is when I was working on my PhD, I uh, wish I could remember the textbook, but there's chapters on the military has been having like commercial aircraft, like uh, 737 size drones, but they've been crashing them. And, and the interesting thing is when I was watching why they were crashing, 
because it kind of the joke was, oh, let's just let the military keep crashing airplanes. It'll keep it at bay for a while. Uh, the interesting thing is why they were crashing airplanes is exactly why we used to crash airplanes. And then we figured out crew resource management, communication, briefing, and how you just can't walk away. You got to bring the other guy in the loop when you're going on a break. And mm -hmm. if they would ever at the drone level, just go talk to the commercial airline pilots and say, here, make us some procedures, they would crash fewer airplanes. <laughs> because they're, when I'm looking at all the mistakes they're making and why they're crashing, I'm thinking, Huh, we used to do that like 10 years ago. So they're not communicating with each other, is that for sure? Um, yeah. And yeah. of course, my husband flies you know that. Happen, so uh, <laughs> I think what will happen is right now, we, like in my uh, flying to Sydney, we required four pilots. They're going to, com combination with the pilot shortage, combination with the automation, that they're going to say, oh, they're going to get approval, especially with the new FA administrator. Um, they're, they're going to get approval from going from four pilots to three, from three pilots to two, and then two pilots, one will be there and it'll be monitoring. And, you know, so. Do you uh, think that um, just like the broader population would trust that though? Because, I mean, I just think that's one of those interesting questions, whether you're talking about airplanes or, you know, I think the same question is now coming up in things like driverless cars that, it feels like people, you know, on a broad scale, people are so distrustful of technology and afraid of it, mostly because they're not really educated. That I feel like even if you could show data that like, you know, obviously as a pilot, I would want to support there being pilots. But even if you could show people data that like, oh, automation is safer, that people would still be like, yeah, but I don't trust the computer. I want to know that, you know, because we trust each other more than we trust the computers. So I really wonder how much people could persuade the public that it's okay to not have any pilot on the aircraft. Yeah, I think that they're going to get, a, they'll probably have one on there. And I think they're going to, I think they're going to use the data that they're gathering from all these ASAP reports to show, look at pilot, just make errors, automation won't. And here's the interesting thing. I remember years ago when we were flying a uh, four engine aircraft over the ocean and they were going to do ETOPS two engines and everybody I spoke to, every pilot, every passenger said, every pilot said, I'll never fly two engines over the ocean. Every passenger I ever talked to said, I'll never get on an airplane with two engines and go over the ocean. And now that's all we do. So yeah, so they'll, they'll feed it in unless there's some antagonist like myself on the news going, no, 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 we have, this is why we can't do that. So, but they're going to try. Um, Abby's probably going to see it. Except for a great idea. So <laughs> remember that movie, the movies, um, uh, airplane movies? Yes. I mean, did you see them? Like airplane? Like the airplane movie? Yeah. Like yeah, movie. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, I'm going to write the next airplane movie. It's going to be called uh, uh, Next Gen, the other airplane movie. And it's going to be this uh, beautiful blonde and really good looking, uh, she's the captain, really good looking guy and they're standing at the door giving out wings and they get on this airplane and, and it's gonna be a comedy. But ultimately we learn at the end of the day when everything breaks and they can't, nobody can fly this airplane is that they're actors because nobody will get on an airplane without pilots. And it's cheaper to play actor than pilot. And they have this automated aircraft. So these, we're gonna find out later that these are just pi actors that are playing the part of the pilots. They put the uniform on and go up and, and, and we find out when it breaks, when they bring the uh, checklist out, the uh, quick reference handbook and they pull it out, it's gonna say script. And so I don't know how to fly the airplane. You know, I can't fly the airplane. That team to me how to fly the airplane. So yeah, I have it all plotted out. I just have to sit down and write it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, that <one> yeah. that. <laughs> something that I think would be kind of interesting to see how like the single pilot stuff would work would be like just with fatigue alone because I feel like when you have someone there to talk with for like I, I only fly for like two hours I think my longest flight commercially has been like three hours or so but if you're not talking like every once in a while it's fatiguing just kind of just sitting there by yourself so I can I can't even imagine like people fall have fallen asleep just in with two people in the plane before without all this automation. So I don't know. I think that would be really interesting to see what happens with that. I know it, it is because that's how we. I stay awake too. Is when if you engage in good conversation, you you just stay more alert. And they have tons of data that show even just sitting there silent monitoring 
it, it's fatiguing just looking you know joining on you just kind of kind of tune out um something really funny though the i think it was somebody in the union their rebuttal to why we cut needed uh two pilots was because of crew resource management and i'm looking at that i'm thinking huh how do you, you need to learn how to work with yourself <laughs> <laughs> in our careers, we teach each other how to get along and communicate and, and work together as a team. And so I was trying to figure out how that crew resource comment worked with when you're up there by yourself. <laughs> like you learn how to talk to yourself nicer. You know? <laughs> um, but I think that fi the fatigue is really huge. It really is. Um, and, you know, but, but once again, if you're just monitoring and you have warning systems that go off, the triple seven actually has, um, it, it gives you an alert and a little warning if you go for more than, now I forget, I wanna say like 90 minutes, maybe two hours without touching anything. And then it alerts you to make sure you're not asleep. Interesting. So, yeah, so our, our game was kind of like to, let's see if we cannot touch anything. <laughs> and I mean, any, <laughs> anything, if you touch something and turn a knob, then it restarts it over, but. How obnoxious is the alert? Will it wake you it's up? Not, I think it would. It's not that obnoxious. Uh, there was a um, a crew that actually fell asleep. Uh, both captains go uh, captain and first officer. Uh, they had a di had a divert. They were uh, medical emergency divert, and then they were um, pressed on. And on final, they both fell asleep. The gear wasn't down. There was a too low gear. Uh, so the gear warning went off and didn't wake the captain up, but woke the first officer up and he yelled gear and the captain stayed asleep. So when he put the gear down, that woke him up and they landed. Oh my God. But yeah. So, so if nothing else, having somebody there to wake you up, if you fall asleep too, you know, wow. but yeah, it's an, it's an interesting uh, industry, but our whole industry is about money and it's about saving money and 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 then bypassing you know there and there's you know there's ways you can save money you can just do it smarter and train smarter and still do better you know and they could still save money but i don't know they don't yeah i don't know it's, it'll be interesting but i'm going to do everything i can you know so so for for abby and for is anyone else in your group uh, airline pilot mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to go to Sky West. You will be. Yeah. So, yeah. So I might one day. <laughs> you might one day. I just started flying a year ago. I, I, I work full time at a startup, so I, I have a real job and a real career already. Uh, but I've fallen in love with flying. So I'm trying to assess my options. And so things like this are really interesting to me to have these discussions about like, what's the future of the industry? Because I wonder, you know, do I want to make a jump just because I love it? And then 30 years into my career before I've hit retirement, lose my job to the machines. <laughs> well, and you know, that's, that's interesting. Cause I started when I would go over to like, um, there's a race back aviation high school and I would go talk to the students. I just kind of, and this has been, Oh, it's probably been maybe five years since I've been over there. But even back then I was asking the, you know, and the, um, students, how many are going to be pilots? And a lot of the young men in there saying they weren't going to do it because it wasn't enough money and they, the more money was in the computers and that's where it was going to go. So they were, it, it shifted decision. You know, even right now with COVID, I thought, God, if I was just starting out to be a pilot, what would I do now? You know, if I, would I still pre press on with it? Um, that's a lot different from, I went to that high school. So like 10 years ago, it was, there wasn't that reaction. So I can't, that changes really fast. <laughs> it, does. it really does. So. I feel like there's also the question though of like, you know, what's going to make you the most money, but then like, what brings you the most joy? Cause I think about that all the time, you know, as I'm trying to decide what I'm going to do is that when I'm out there flying, like I love it and I'm so engaged with it. And I'm like, even if I made less over the course of my career flying, which is still a pretty good paying job, uh, once you make up far enough, uh, maybe it'd be worth it because I get a lot more joy out of it than just sitting in front of a computer, which is what I do now, which is all we, what we all do now. But <laughs> in front of a computer, just be in the sky. So. 
because my airplane literally is just a big computer, but it's so cool. I love it happens to fly though. My computer just sits on my desk. (laughs) Yeah. You know what? Here's the thing about, about your quality of life. I'll have to tell you there are, so I'm a first officer. I could be a captain in a narrow body in some 37 or and, and commuting and, and flying all night and doing multiple legs. And I kind of like, you know, I'd be making more money. I'd have that first stripe. I'd have the big ego and could say, oh, look at me, I'm a captain. But you know what, quality of life and having fun and enjoying it is, mm-hmm. is so much to that. It really is. Um, and I, I think a lot of people don't understand that. And so you'll hear a lot of people griping about the airline job. It's because they did it for the money probably or they're in there for more for the money than they are for, they lose their love of, of flying. And like when I go to work, I still, my favorite thing is to uh, take wings. I still give wings out to the kids and stuff at the terminal. And that's the fun part of the job, you know, it's like, and then the takeoff and landing, but droning <laughs> for 15 hours to sit is a long night. <laughs> Where are you flying tonight, Carlene? Um, I'm just going down to Atlanta. I'll be down to Atlanta tonight because I have a, a day of training and another check ride. So, yeah, so I do a check ride. And then apparently, if you don't get consolidated, um, we have to go back out and do OE again. So I have to go get scheduled with another Czech airman. And uh, so, but it'll be good because at least I'll get the landings. <laughs> so. Can I add a, I have a maintenance twist to the enjoyment of aviation. It'll take about two minutes. Can I just add it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So I understand about, you know, the pilots and the money. Um, money is a big draw for careers. And, and, and it is. Uh, finances are, are huge. But um, <laughs> I worked at a, uh, I got out of the army, worked at a drop forage company doing uh, welding. I went to school for, to be a welder so I could get this <sighs> Massively paying job. I couldn't believe how much they paid. It was a union shop. Man, we make good money. But I missed working on helicopters all the time and let alone you know, any type of thing that would fly. So a job did come open at the airport and I wanted that so bad. I took a, back in the day, you know, a pay cut like $3 an hour. That was, back in the day, that was a lot of money, but it was worth it for me to get back into aviation instead of making oh, all this ridiculous money welding at a drop forge company. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and you know what? And that's the thing. I think that's probably a lot of the difference between men and women because um, I don't know. I think sometimes guys' egos more tied to their dollar, how much they're making, mm-hmm. you know, that we can actually appreciate life. But you know what? Maybe not, because I just ran into my a uh, friend of mine, she's a captain. And I was coming back from New York through Detroit. So we had that first leg and we sat together and we had a discussion on ethics. And I said, so I'm going to ask all of you, is there anything, any amount of money or anything that you would do? Um, say somebody said, you will lose your job, um, but you have to harm that person. You have to lie, set them up and make them lose their job. And I told her, I said, no way I would ever do anything like that. And, and she said that I was rare. And I'm thinking, no, I cannot be the only person that would not harm somebody. <laughs> you know, if I, would, I would say, no, try and take my job, but I'm not going to do it. You know, I just wouldn't do something to harm somebody um, for money or for my job or anything. And she said that I was rare that most people would. So question of all of you, would any of you ever harm anyone for money? <laughs> Like, would you, would your job be more valuable than lying and hurting somebody? Mm-hmm. No? Okay, good. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm just not made that way. I just yeah. do it. I hate, I hate um, un, untruth. Um, people that lie, you know they're lying because, well, come on, I'm a safety inspector. Right. I, I already looked at what they did. <laughs> so I don't hate them for it, but... It, it's very displeasing. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, I was shocked when she said that. I'm thinking, huh, I mean, I would never do that. So I, I'm surprised. I don't think that I'm a rare person in that manner. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Yeah, that's kind of one of the reasons I'm no longer with Boeing. So 
<laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, I think, and, and the, really the thing, like, Abby, you've got a really long career ahead of you, and, and it's going to be your generation that's going to have to, you know, be able to do the right thing and stand up for the right thing when they try and put you down a different path. And it's tough. Um, a question, is there any sexual harassment going on at your airline right now? Um, does it still go on? Um, I've never experienced anything. I think I've heard of like, sometimes like the captain flight attendant dynamic on like an overnight, that type of thing. But I never heard anything between like a female, like pilot and a male pilot or anything. But then again, I don't know. I've only been here a year. <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, I am actually really surprised how rampant it still is going on out there. And none of the women say anything because they can't. And because you get flagged, you know, it's like gossip gets running around and stuff. But um, yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of women who have signed, who thinks it's been gross, have signed on disclosures just so they can keep their job and and come back. So there's a lot of work to do still at the airline level. But Where my, are you going to get your law degree? Um, I'm actually going to go to University of Washington. Uh, and I put in, well, I've been studying the LSAT so I can not make a total failure of myself uh, trying to pass it. It's really interesting how you, different, like the logic questions and stuff, but um, you just have to learn how to pass you know, learn how to think differently to be able to pass that test. And so, um, but I put in a bid to bid back to the 330 in Seattle. It is, I don't know, I think about $10 an hour less pay, but I will be a little bit more senior. And then I can be working on reserve and just drive to the University of Washington, actually just go to real class, which would be fun. Yeah. So that's the plan because I figure I'm going to retire in six years. And so if I can get in law school and retire with a law degree and my yoga certification, I'll be, <laughs> I'll be good to go. I'll figure out what, I'll figure out what my next career is going to be after, after six years. Well, weren't you looking into this? You were doing screenwriting already, right? I went to one class to learn how to do it. Yeah. And so I know how to do it. It's that in itself is an interesting program. So what I what I figured out, if anyone wants to write movies, this is what you have to do: write the book first, get it copyrighted, and then go write your screenplay. Because Hollywood will steal your screenplay. And if you don't have either, if you you got to be in the writer's guild to get it in there. And if you give it to somebody who's in the writer's guild, they start you know showing it around, then it will get taken because you can't copyright an idea. Mm -hmm. But if you make the book first, you can. But that's gonna be the hard part, learn, figuring out how to write a comedy book, like for my airplane one, but, but I'm gonna do it. Um, and then interesting thing with the screenplay, you have to, once you sell it, you don't have any control over it for a movie. You do for, for a play. The writer has a lot of control over it, but, but the movies you don't. And uh, they have high school, not high school, college kids who are reading these screenplays at the first level. So you have to write the dialogue that's something that's appealing to the college age group. And then, and then they start moving it up, you know, and then it gets kind of rewritten anyway. But, but it's, it's, a, it's a talent to be able to write a screenplay, I think. Because you have to, you have very few words. You like you get one paragraph to explain walking what the whole room looks like and then you need to have really snappy dialogue between the characters and you know, really have to be a good writer to do that very with a lot of imagery so one day i'll get there <laughs> now tell us your favorite place to fly uh i would have to say it used to well we don't fly there anymore it was um singapore Love Singapore and Guam. I love Singapore and Guam are my favorite. Where's your favorite place to take off? Uh, I don't know. My favorite place to land is Seattle because I'm coming home. <laughs> um, 
gosh, favorite place to take off. I hadn't thought about that. Um, actually, I don't know if I have a favorite place to take off because it's kind of exciting just taking off anywhere, really. So it's one of those things when you get in a big jet and you know, and, and actually probably the smaller ones too. But when I get an airplane and it's, you hang onto the thrust levers and you put the power back forward, I just have a smile on my face. Even today, I still do. And so it's like, yeah, I get to fly. <laughs> so, and it's kind of fun that if, it's kind of fun having that enthusiasm and, and still enjoy it because then the other guys you're flying with are going, you know, they forget, they forget how, how they used to enjoy it too. Mm -hmm. So, oh, 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 and then I just put a picture up on Twitter. A friend of mine from Qantas sent me this picture of a simulator and a little movie. And this guy built a 777 simulator in his house. And I put this picture, and he has a, an actual cart, and it's a real cart off an airplane, you know, the catering cart. It has a bottle of champagne on it. And it's like his little wine rack and some little snacks, but you can see it's a doorway to his room, his house, and the simulator's in there. And I, he, they send this, he goes, oh yeah, my friend sent this. I go, oh, this is really cool. So I put it on Twitter. And in 24 hours, it has over 2,500 hearts. It's so cool looking. It's just gone viral. And I said, can I put something about when your airline, when you buy your, your airline sells you a catering cart, it really, it makes, it adds to your home built simulator. And it took him three years to build it. Found out this guy's not even a pilot. And he built this thing and he's, and he's flying it. And so I asked my friend that, I go, send me the information. So I have a picture of him and he went out and rented he went to the military and rented uh, to go t learn how to do barrel rolls in an airplane. He did never flown before. He just went out and with this instructor and did this. He's only flown his Microsoft computer. And then it took him three years and he has, a, he has his prototype. He built the whole thing out of wood and then he got the panels. I'm gonna put it up on my blog. But I don't know if I would get it up by tomorrow, but it's gonna be on there. It's really cool. I'm thinking, who does that? And, and I thought, oh, it had to be some pilot do it. No. Just so some computer guy who loves flying, who flies his little simulator. <laughs> yeah, so I'll look for that. I don't. I don't have Twitter, but I'll yeah, look. For I'll, it. I'll have it. I'll have it on my blog. I'll, I'll put it on. I'm gonna try and see if I can upload his video too. He's got a full screen. You would never know he is not in a professional in a Boeing simulator. Um, it's and then and then the only things they said that the only thing is when my friend was telling me about this. I said, this is so cool. And I go, it's the most amazing thing I've ever saw. And then Nathan writes, yeah, but the fire switches don't rotate. And I said, well, I'll tell him it doesn't matter if his fire switches rotate. Cause I said, rotate, I made some comment about rotating fire switches are overrated. And then I thought about it that, well, unless he actually has the engines, I go, what's in his backyard? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's, it really is neat. I want one of them. I want a simulator like that. He did a whole, built his, turned his office into an airplane. <laughs> Do any of you have questions for Ms. Carlene? Anyway? Yeah, I was interested in why you're interested in writing more children's books. Like what's the appeal for you? Oh, I, because I love kids. And I think that really our future I don't know. I think if we can start writing books that start bringing ethics and inspiration, just some good stuff to the kids that they can maybe get some, you know, have fun reading and then learn life, learn a little bit of life in a different manner, you know. Um, it's, I think you should write one for a girl's aged nine to 12. Nine to 12. Well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm gonna write a book, my grand, one of my grandsons, he loves Fortnite and he's always playing Fortnite. And this is, he's, I think he just turned 11. And this is, he's like consumed with this. And so it's hard to, and, and so it's hard to get him to read a book. And this particular daughter, um, she has her PhD in geology and she's teaching, she's got a lot of stuff going on. and. and his little sister is nine. So we were talking and I'm like, hey, Alice, we're going to write a book about Miles. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a book with this little boy who's playing Fortnite. And he ends up because they had given us a portal so we could talk via this portal thing. Have you guys ever seen what the portal is? 
it's kind of cool. It's like a big screen, but it's like covers the whole room. And so you can like, you're right there talking with them. And, and, and so I've dance party with my, my granddaughter in our portal, but I decided that we were going to have a portal and he was going to go, he was playing Fortnite. And he's going to get sucked into this game. And now Fortnite in the game, the characters have different skins. And so whoever you are, you, you can wear different skins. So I thought, wouldn't that be interesting? Get this kid stuck into, sucked into the game that he plays all the time, have all these characters and not know who the good guys or the bad guys are and who has the different, uh, different skins and then figure out how to survive with create you know creatively with wit to and find a way to get out and then and get out on, on the other side to get back out and so I'm going to write this book with these about these and then I and I told him I and I told my little granddaughter I said yeah I'm right I was telling her about this I said yeah and, and he's going to have this really cute little sister <laughs> she starts laughing so she's helping me decide how we're going to plot it how we're going to get the map and how if you get the map then you have to go to the treasure chest you know so. So, okay, so how does that apply help kids? Well, here's this little boy who's really not into reading. He just wants to play his video games. But if I make something that is tied to the world that he loves, it will get him reading, you know? And I think that's kind of important if we can get kids to read because if we can open up reading to them, then it opens up the world to them. And, and in today's world, I, we're so computer. Everything is computer. These kids are not you know yeah sitting there reading a book every four days you know it's just like or four books every uh three days or whatever <laughs> you know they're just playing their computer games and they and i don't and i think that with covid and the online learning it's probably even worse because i don't know if kids are just reading books anymore but and how many aviation books are out there for for kids right exactly. think about it or like um when the schools were open for career day, how many people really work in aviation and go into a school and let kids know that there's more than just um, being a, a technician or a pilot or air traffic control. There's so much more to support you for an hour in flight. Right, exactly, exactly. I love to, yeah. yeah, they need to write, write the, the kids book. Course. Thank yeah. you for doing that. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, oh, Abby, so how do you like flying for SkyWest? I really like it so far. I really like base in Denver flying, like, because a lot of our flights are really short, so we'll just fly, like, hour-long flights over the Rockies back and forth, and it's so beautiful. I really love it. You guys have a really good reputation for training, um, for survivability when you get to the other, when you get to the majors, because most of the majors aren't really training. Um, they're expecting you to come prepared. And so they don't really, it's not like the old days where we get somebody and then give you the tools, how to learn and what to learn. You just show up and they kind of put you through it. So, yeah, that is good. I heard also there's a lot between like, cause we fly two airplanes at SkyWest, depending on like what airplane you choose to fly and like how well you're prepared for the future too. I don't know. I just think it's kind of interesting. <laughs> what airplane do you fly? I fly the CRJ, so we don't have like the auto throttles and we don't have, like we have to do our own descent planning and stuff where the 125 has auto throttles and stuff. So that's why it was like interesting talking about that stuff earlier because I'm like, oh, my plane's not that automated. So I can't even imagine my plane just flying on its own. <laughs> yeah, and you are getting the good skills. Yeah, like, yeah you are, really are. So you're getting the good scan that people don't have anymore. Yeah, I really enjoy it though. And we find a lot of cool, sorry, I'm just like talking about SkyWest now but too much, but we find a lot of really cool places like Moab um, and then like we fly to Jackson Hole and a bunch of really, I guess, hard airports to go into. So I really enjoy it. Oh, good. Good. And then Trimby, when are you going to be there? Uh, when Abby's my captain. <laughs> 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 yeah, they're bringing back some people who started the training back I guess last February, last March, they're bringing them back now. Yeah, we we had so many, because of COVID, they just got a lot of retirements and then they furloughed 400 pilots for a very short time. They're already back. And I think we're going to be hiring again this year. I will, I will be surprised if we don't start hiring before the end of the year again. 
And I went and got my COVID shot today. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I just got the first. So my arm's a little sore. I told them to, to do it on the left arm because I have to use my right arm for that stick when I go back to training. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say, how do you, how did, yeah, yeah, how did you know which arm? I still have to put the thrust for, and you know, this is really interesting. So we're in this three hundred and fifty, big airplane, twin engine that has a has a little bit of auto rudder. The triple seven did too, and so on the missed approach, if you have a single engine, you have to put in rudder. Now it'd been a long time since I did the single engine work. So I had a captain sitting seat support Czech airman and the Czech airman behind me. And I said to him, I said, so how much rudder, uh, does this take a lot of rudder for a missed single engine missed approach? And he said, what plane did you come off? I said, triple seven. He says, oh yeah, a lot more. I said, a lot like a 737? Oh yeah, definitely. Now 737, boy, you had to thrust forward foot. It was almost like your thrust hand and your feet were working together. It was a lot to keep that thing going straight. And I'm thinking, oh, okay. So we come in for our missed approach, go around at full, full power or toga power and rotate it. And I put in the rudder. Now we have the a little thing. It's a little beta target. So it's like a little boat. Um, and so it's, I'm putting in my rudder and I'm maintaining directional control off of this rudder. And I look down and it's way to the left because I'm going, oh, I have way too much rudder in, but I must have been, you know, I was keeping it straight. So I started bringing it out and came back and I go, huh. And so I asked him, check your arm and he said, could we, I go, do you take a snapshot? And he goes, yeah. And he go, can you zap me back? I'm really curious. I want to see what would happen in this airplane if I didn't put any rudder in. And he said, did you have a lot? And I go, yeah. Did you look at my boat? It was way left on way too much rudder in. And so... We went back and, and did this again. And I said, okay, guys, I'm putting my feet on the floor. I would never do this in a real airplane, but I don't want to inadvertently put some in. I just want to see what it does. And, um, and then my captain, I got, and I said to them, I said, I just love doing science projects. And this Czech airman says, so do I. And I go, okay, good. So we did it. And I went and gave full toga power and this missed approach and put my feet on the floor. And the little beta just kind of went just a little tiny bit to the right. And, and it was just perfectly stable. I'm going, holy cow. And then I put it on, just squeaked in a little bit. You don't need right. And, and they're saying, oh yeah, you need a lot. And so now we're going, wow, wow. It was really interesting because they're, everyone on this plane had been teaching everybody incorrectly and it worked, but it wasn't quite right. You know, apparently you can still slip it, but I have a lot of rudder with that engine and still get it maintain directional control, just kind of slipping a little bit. But, but those are the kind of things that I like doing. I like messing around the simulator, see what, what it can do, just so you, you know, so you know when you get out there if it were really lost an engine out there. So I think what happens with that stick because it's really sensitive and people get stirring, up, stirring the pot on it, um, it's because you go around and you think you need a lot of rudder and you put a little bit too much and you get the yaw and then inadvertently you're putting aileron thinking it, but with, with the fly-by-wire, it's not like an aileron in a real airplane. Fly-by-wire is just a, you're just telling it a G loading. So, it, I mean, it's really a kind of a weird concept, but it's really a neat airplane to fly if you figure out what you're doing. You know, it's, um, and then the, the stick on the, on the get the flight director nailed and they bring you around and you take they said okay you're going to hand fly it take the autopilot off okay take the autopilot off and don't do anything don't even just hold your hand on the stick and you don't do anything it just flies itself it's 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 this old theory that somebody had told me years ago that um they, um stable that's pilots that make them unstable nervous so you know, it's, it's really a neat airplane. Um, and it, I really, really like it a lot. I have a question for you, Carleen. Yeah. Um, so I think, I would think I would really like to fly for Delta one day. Do you have any recommendations for what we can do while we're at the regionals or before to kind of make ourselves more presentable for Delta? Or do you have any recommendations? I know with COVID, everything's definitely getting pushed back. Yeah, so... Here's a really interesting thing. Co uh, Delta's been changing their hiring practices, okay? Um, they used to have two psychiatrists 
father and son and you had to come and sit and be in front of them and then they would ask you questions like they'd want to see if you sat in the easy chair or the rocking chair or if you were rocking or you'd sit in the firm one they ask you if you drink your beer out of a bottle or a can i mean really weird things uh, then i think the dad committed suicide then they shifted from these people because one of them killed himself to a new group and the new group which I think it was, it's probably been, they probably are still there. The young lady, it's her dad's company who's in charge of this. And I know this because one of our pilots who was sitting in my jump seat was telling me what was going on. And so maybe it's been, been three years, but he says the interviewing process, they want you to have one speeding ticket. If you have more than one, you're a rule breaker. But if you don't have any, you're not human. And he says, because she believes everybody has had a ticket in their life. And I turned around and said, I didn't. The captain goes, I didn't. Another pilot, the first, other first officer goes, I didn't. None of us did. And we're like, well, that's kind of weird. Um, yeah, like I go out and get a speaking ticket. I don't have one right now. <laughs> uh, I get one. Yeah. I mean, it was weird that they thought that that was viewed as something good. But the one thing that he did tell me, and out of all this that I hadn't thought of before for Delta, they have, we've got a lot of, charities and we've got a like a like a habitat for this or that so he said that you could donate to one of their groups and you don't have to donate a lot he because he had a niece that was trying to get on with the airline so this is what he had her do uh donate a dollar a month or a dollar every six months because if you're a regular donor to whatever charity it is and they're not allowed to ask you how much but when you go in an interview, you can say, yes, I'm a donor to Delta's, an annual or monthly donor to Delta's Habitat for Humanity or whatever thing you go through. And they really looked, they looked highly on that. Uh, most all airlines, it used to be uh, being an instructor was really important because then they wanted instructors, but now we're getting away from line instructors so much. But leadership roles, they like community service type stuff. Um, so, you know, just being involved in your community to make yourself kind of well-rounded. I uh, hate to say this, they don't like women, but um, now that times are changing and we have the lowest percentage of women, that's getting shifted too. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, it, it will, it is changing. But one of our female pilots, uh, she's a good friend of our, mine now, she was in women aviation. She was applying for Delta's, oh, do that. Apply for the type rating scholarship at Women in Aviation. Oh, you know what? I wonder if Delta's still doing that. Did any of you go to the Women in Aviation this year? I think it was virtual. Yeah, uh, I, I didn't notice if Delta has a scholarship right now. You know what? Because now I'm thinking just before this last okay. time, they were starting to pull out and doing their own little conference, like a, you know, for pilot hiring. But we were giving out scholarships at Women in Aviation and if you get a scholarship from Delta, you will get a job. That's your, you, you got the job locked in. They'll give you that before. And one of our pilots, uh, um, this gal, she wasn't a pilot person at the time, but she had been trying every single year for like four years and couldn't get the scholarship. And she said, hey, somebody told me you were a writer. Would you mind looking at my scholarship? And I looked at it and this was probably about I don't know, maybe six years ago. And I looked at it and I read it and I thought, oh, it's a really good scholarship, but we need to change it. Cause it says, I'm a woman ever since I was a little girl. And she kept embracing her womanhood, which you would think would be normal because it's a women in aviation scholarship, right? And I said, nah, probably not for this airline. I said, let's just take out all the gender. We don't have to say I'm a woman. Let's just say, you know, ever since I was, uh, you know, 10 years old, I'd want to do this. And, and we, t we sanitized it and took out any reference to gender from it. And she won it that year and she got, and she never got her typewriting, but they gave her a job. And the tests, they change those like monthly when you get an interview. And apparently the military, Guys in the Air Force, everyone who goes and gets a test, they keep giving the battery questions and they have a file at some Air Force base with all the Delta questions because they change them regularly and they put them all in there. So if some one of the Air Force guys is going to go, they just go to their base and they pull out the questions and prepare for it. So I don't know how we can get you those, but oh. <laughs> no, <I'm sorry. laughs> but. Oh. 
Yeah, but really just community service type stuff. And I really thought that was kind of a brilliant idea, you know, for 12 bucks a year, if you donate a dollar a month, you know, to be able to say, hey, I'm an annual, uh, you know, I donate annually to Delta's, you know, group. So, um, and then just keep your training record clean, you know, because mm -hmm. they do not like any failures at all. That's a, um, you know, but other than that, you'll be, you'll be right there. Okay. Thanks for the advice for that. Yeah. Yeah. And how many hours do you have? If you, uh, and are you a captain right now? No, I'm a first officer. Um, I didn't fly very much my first year with COVID. I was off basically all last summer. <laughs> oh, yeah. But um, I need to do my logbook, but I think I have around 15 to 1600 hours. I don't have very many still. Yeah. If you can get checked, if you can get a left seat checkout, they really like really like that if you get some mm -hmm. seat so we'll see how long that is now i have no idea <laughs> yeah and 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 that's the problem with going to because sky west is one that you know favorable commuter airlines but because of that people stay there longer and it's harder to upgrade sky west has a good reputation and it'll keep preceding you so i'll well, definitely see if i ever get a call <laughs> well and then when you do get a call um let me know. And then I'm, I'm trying to keep tabs because for quite a while, people were who said, hey, I have an interview at Delta. So then I would go find somebody who just got hired by Delta. And then I'd say, hey, would they, you know, so I kind of connect people and find out, you know, so you could at least know what the interview process was like and stuff. But you're not going to have any problem with it once once you get in there. And, and if they bring you for an interview, then they believe you're qualified. And it's really from there, can you succeed? And, and if they believe you succeed, you'll get, you'll get. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. It'll be fun. Hurry and get there so I can fly with you before I retire. <laughs> That'd be amazing. <laughs> probably let you uh, get to the airport. I know. I still got a little time. I'm going to go pack. I'm going to go put my pants on since I'm not wearing any right now. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm wearing my sweatpants, but I still have them packed and got the rest of that bottom half dressed yet, but I'll get there. <laughs> You know, well, and, yeah, so. on behalf of Women in Aviation Mile High, we really want to thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. It was nice to meet all of you. And hopefully when all this COVID stuff lifts, we'll all come down and, meet and we'll do a real in-person. For sure. I'll see you need to, uh, I think you really should do it and go for it. Because the reality is, um, no longer is, are people really sitting in jobs for 30, 40 years. You know what? You get in there and you do it. And if the job goes away, you have so many talents and skills, you go do something else. You know, they can't take it away from you. Mm -hmm. And it's just got to, got to sometimes just go with the flow. Cause one thing I learned is there are no guarantees in this life, you know, and, and especially with this career, cause you could lose your medical, you know, do it for a month and, and lose it and you just don't know so i say if you have the opportunity to do it get those hours do it come fly yeah, it down we'll, fly together. i'm gonna keep flying that's for sure and we'll see where it goes no good all right you guys well thank you so much and thank good. you yeah thank you thank Bye. you carlene all right have a wonderful night and sorry okay. to talk fly from the cockpit but one day. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, everybody, for coming.